Welcome to the Howenstein Center's Wheelhouse Talk with Dan Varner. My name is Kenya Shakir, and I am a Cook Leadership Academy Fellow. I'm currently in the Graduate Program for Higher Education Administration here at Grand Valley. As you might already know, the Howenstein Center's Wheelhouse Talks highlight the philosophies and experiences of leaders from a variety of disciplines, communities, and cultures. These leaders take center stage and share with us personal stories of trial and triumph. Their lessons learned are beacons of integrity and vision it takes to overcome life's toughest obstacles. The Wheelhouse Talks are a space for reflection. They are a call to arms for anyone seeking positive change, and they are a celebration of human endeavors and the potential within us all. It is my pleasure to formally introduce our special guest speaker today. Driven by a deep commitment to Detroit, Dan Varner has been instrumental in advancing nonprofit and educational infrastructure of the city. In November 2016, Dan became the president and CEO of Goodwill Industries of Greater Detroit, leading efforts to support 900 plus local businesses with a reliable workforce and empowering trainees with the skills for workplace success. Before joining Goodwill, Dan served as the CEO of Excellent Schools Detroit, a partnership of city organizations working to improve Detroit's public education system. He is also the co-founder and CEO of Think Detroit, a nationally recognized youth development organization. After merging with the Detroit Police Ath Athlete League, the organization became the largest provider of youth development sports programs in the city, serving 13,000 participants a year. Dan serves on many boards, including the ACLU of Michigan, Connect Ed, and Detroit Police Athletic League. He also serves on Michigan State's Board of Education and is a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. An attorney by training, he is a graduate of both the University of Michigan and the U of M Law School. Please join me in welcoming Dan Varner as he shares his leadership story. Good afternoon. Uh, we can do a little better than that. Good afternoon, Grand Valley State University. All right, how are we doing today? Good, good. I will be a little conversational in style. I'm not a kind of behind the mic, formal speaker. I'll walk this stage a little bit. So um, hopefully none of that will get too uh, distracting. Um, and I can't wait for the opportunity to actually engage in discussion uh, at the end of all this. So I'm um, really excited to be here with you today. Um, so thank you to all of you, to President Haas. Uh, thank you for the invitation to Chad and the Howenstein team. Uh, and to all of the faculty and students here at GVSU, it's, uh, a, it's not every day that you get invited to come across the state to talk to folks about your experience. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be able to do so. So thank you. Um, so I was asked to come today and tell you a little bit, well, so to talk about leadership, uh, but really through two lenses. One was through the lens of kind of my life experience, uh, and then uh, to reflect a little bit on that and share kind of lessons about leadership from uh, my life experience and from you know, my, my efforts to lead uh, and the like. Um, and so I'll do that today, and I'll, I, this is a little, I was, saying before uh, just a few minutes ago that um, it's a little unusual, like I actually get to tell my life story and I don't usually stand up in front of a room full of folks and tell my life story. So it's a different kind of uh, engagement for me um, and an interesting one uh, in that regard. So hopefully it won't be too boring um, for all of you. It's, you know how it is, like you love talking about yourself. Like I get to talk about my life story, right? But that doesn't mean it's gonna be interesting for any of you. Um, so, I think with that, so the, yeah, I'm gonna break this into kind of two sections. Sorry, I've got some notes over here to make sure I don't miss anything important. One is I'm just gonna try and run through kind of my life to date, fairly quickly, like 10, 15 minutes, but just give you a flavor of some of the stuff that um, I've taken on or been through or what have you. Um, I will highlight a few moments uh, in that story um, and just dive a little bit deeper just to give you a sense of, of what was going on. Um, and then I'm going to circle back kind of in sta the second stage to talk a little bit about lessons learned out of all of that. Um, and I'll refer back sometimes to that story and sometimes not. Um, it's just kind of lessons that I've learned um, along the way. So uh, with that, I guess we'll just jump into uh, about me. So um, I tell folks all the time the, the most uh, 
the best thing I've ever done in life uh, is be a dad. I got three amazing kids. Uh, my oldest is a sophomore in college uh, down in Atlanta at Emory University, and then I've got two girls still at home, uh, senior in high school, and I'm a sixth grader. Um, and by far, like the best leadership lessons I've ever learned have come in attempting to lead them. Uh, so it's always the place that I begin when I talk about leadership. Um, a little bit more about me. So I was born in Detroit. I am a Detroit kid. Uh, back in 1969, which was an amazing year, And the story is, um, my folks wanted to travel. Uh, my dad was, uh, he worked at, at Marathon Petroleum, an oil refinery in southwest Detroit. And uh, he and my mom wanted to travel and see the world and didn't have a ton of money. So my dad applied for jobs at, at refineries overseas and was offered a job at a refinery in Saudi Arabia and another one uh, at a refinery in St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands. So my first memories, which you might imagine, are of paradise. Like literally rainforests, beaches, uh, you know, everything that the Virgin Islands have to offer. Uh, was there for a little over six years. Um, and learned to swim there. It'll become uh, important later in the story, but if you grow up uh, on an island like St. Croix, you learn to swim. Uh, and swimming becomes one of your things. Tim Duncan, folks know Tim Duncan, are you guys too young to, yeah. So Tim Duncan, famous NBA basketball player, uh, with the San Antonio Spurs, much younger than I am, but grew up on St. Croix and was a swimmer uh, until he became a basketball player. A hurricane kind of ruined the pool, uh, and you move to ocean swimming when the pool gets ruined uh, after a hurricane. And ocean swimming is a different thing, and some people are freaked out by it, and Tim evidently was freaked out by it and became a basketball player instead. And so we all got to be blessed by his basketball prowess. Um, so. Uh, to St. Croix, and then to Robinson, so my mom wanted to come back to the States. She was tired of raising two kids far away from family, and we came back to a small farming community in southeastern Illinois called Robinson, Illinois. Uh, there's a marathon plant there. Anybody know what that are, familiar with that area of the country? Kind of near Terre Haute, Indiana, a little bit, yeah? Um, so Robinson, Illinois, small farming community, southeastern Illinois, right near the border with Indiana. And at the time that we moved there in the mid-70s, my sister and I were the only, we were the only black family with school-aged children. And so my sister and I desegregated the school district uh, in Crawford County, Illinois. Um, it was, as you, I, like, you know, it was all that, right, um, and other stuff. Uh, and, I, like, we could spend an hour talking about that experience, which is not what we'll do. Um, what I will say to you, kind of one really important takeaway, maybe two really important takeaways from that time. Um, one was around... Uh, the power of teams. So in that community, in that time in our country, there were great youth sports programs for boys. And I was a pretty good athlete, so I played football, I played basketball, I played baseball, I ran track, kind of did everything. And through that, and I swam, um, kind of found teammates who became allies, who became friends. Uh, in that community, in that time and place uh, in our country, there weren't great youth sports programs for girls. This is pre-Title IX, right? Uh, and so my sister did not have the same youth sports experience and, through, and didn't, as a result, have the opportunity to gain teammates through that experience and so lost the opportunity um, to find allies and friends through that vehicle um, and really struggled to find them elsewhere. And so it was a very different experience for me and my sister. It was hard for me, to be sure, much harder for my sister, um, much more lonely uh, and much more isolating for her. Um, so Robinson, the second quick takeaway from that time uh, there is, you know, obviously around race uh, and the role that race plays in our country. Uh, there is nothing like being uh, in third grade and um, kind of, you know, having it thrown in your face uh, like that, right? So uh, race has been front and center in my life, uh, and I shouldn't call it front, kind of has provided very rich context for my life um, in everything that I've done uh, ever since. Um, and that probably shows up over the course of the rest of the conversation, so I'll move on. We stayed in Robinson for two and a half years, came back here to Detroit where my dad was from, uh, and his, he and his nine siblings were all here, uh, settled in Southfield, Michigan at the time, which was uh, changing over from um, a majority Jewish community to a majority black community, uh, and went to the University of Detroit Jesuit High School and Academy, so I'm Jesuit educated. Uh, and then did the University of Michigan for undergrad in law school, go blue. 
It was a tough weekend last weekend. Um, and uh, while at the University of Michigan and law school, so I, I was a swimmer through high school and then kind of burned out and decided I didn't want to swim anymore. Um, you're like, why is he telling me about swimming? Freshman year did nothing, gained 15 pounds the way that freshmen do in college who don't do anything, right? Uh, and sophomore year saw a flyer that was advertising tryouts for the U of M water polo team, which was a club team that was petitioning for varsity status. And a friend of mine said, I'm gonna go try out, you should come too, and so I went and tried out. Um, and made the team and fell in love with this sport of water polo. Uh, and so played water polo for the next four years uh, through my first year in law school. Was the only raisin in the oatmeal, again. Um, and, uh, and was the Big Ten most valuable player and Midwestern region most valuable player uh, my first year in law school. So uh, was a good water polo player as far as Midwestern water polo players go, which it's not saying much. <laughs> Right? Um, all the great water polo players go out to California. Uh, but fell in love with the game. Um, learned something important there, too. Uh, it's something that we all learn, uh, and that's that sometimes you lose. Uh, so my senior year, so my third year playing water polo, we're playing Indiana in the Big Ten Championship, and we had crushed Indiana all season long. Like, this is not supposed to be a competitive game. Um, we were supposed to win the Big Ten Championship. Big Tens are at Indiana, so it's their home pool, but we're still supposed to crush them. And we are just not able to lose these guys. Uh, and it's a one goal game with a few minutes left, and then they tie it up, and then they go ahead, and we're one goal down, and they're like 30 seconds left. Timeout, and we design a play, and so on, and we run the play to perfection, except that the guy who shoots uh, hits the post, uh, and we lose. And I sat on the edge of that pool, and I cried for 20 minutes, right? And there's like nothing you can do. Like there's no, you don't get a do-over. Like that's it, game over. Sometimes you lose. Sometimes you just lose. Um, it definitely fueled me. Worked out all off season, came back next year. We won Big Tens in Midwestern region and you know, I won those awards that I mentioned earlier. Um, but sometimes you lose, an important lesson. While at the University of Michigan Law School, um, I, uh, had the privilege of leading the Black Law Student Association, and we brought a guy in to speak at our annual banquet. His name was Alan Page. Anybody here know Alan Page? Yeah, so the older folks in the room, right? Some of us are football players, so our gray hair, right? Alan Page was a, uh, he was a member of what was called the Purple People Eaters. Does that ring any bells for any others? Yeah. So this was the uh, defensive line for the Minnesota Vikings back in the 70s. This was a team that went to the Super Bowl four times, lost the Super Bowl every one of those times, but they were a great NFL team, and he was the first, I think, defensive player to win NFL MVP before Lawrence Taylor or anybody else. He was the original, like, great defensive lineman. Um, and he came, he had just run for uh, Supreme Court in Minnesota, and he came, and he's speaking, and it's the same night that Michigan's Fab Five team is playing the Kentucky Wildcats uh, in the... I don't know if it was Elite Eight or Sweet 16. It wasn't quite a Final Four game, but it was that same night. And I'm just asking this guy question after question. The room is going crazy because everyone wants to get out of there and watch the game. <laughs> um, but I fell in love with this man, Alan Page, and ultimately was privileged to be able to go to Minnesota for a year and clerk for him. Um, it's a serendipitous story around how to get there. But I, I want to spend a moment just talking about Alan Page for two reasons. One is... He spent that night talking to an audience of legal scholars, and you can imagine who the professors at the University of Michigan Law School are, right? Um, they're not interested in practice, like they are scholars of the law. Uh, and he spent a night talking to all of us about the importance of community service, right? And the work that he was doing with third graders in Minneapolis, teaching them how to read and so on and so forth. Um, just like fantastic man. And then went to Minnesota and had a chance to work for him and learned how to write, finally, because um, judges do that. They make you write and edit your writing. Um, and he said, uh, and, and learned also while I was there uh, a whole different lesson around race, or at least had it kind of articulated and click for me. We were, um, as, a, as, a, as a clerk for a judge, you actually write their opinions. You draft their opinions. Um, and then they edit them and so on and so forth. And so I got to draft the judge's opinions on two big issues around race. One was around a case uh, where an anonymous jury had been impaneled. So typically as a juror, when, you're, when you sit on a jury, like they, people know who you are. But in this case, because the defendant was so dangerous, folks, like it was an anonymous jury. We didn't know who you were, 
right? And the argument was that, that just the fact that you were anonymous as a juror told you this defendant was so dangerous that you'd want to put him in jail. So it didn't matter whether he was guilty or not. You were going to send him away regardless, right? Because he was that dangerous a person. Um, and then a second case, and he was black, the defendant. Second case was around a young white defendant, young man, uh, who'd committed a crime and was sentenced as a juvenile. Um, and the state was actually arguing that he should have been sentenced as, a, as an adult. Um, and so in essence, if I can just cut to the chase, this case was about kind of discrimination in what we would think of as its classic form. And this case was about what we might today call white privilege, right? This young person who had committed a very similar crime to another young person, African-American, sentenced as an adult, this young person sentenced as a juvenile. Here, a black defendant impaneled, you know, after a lot of white defendants had not had anonymous juries, this black defendant gets an anonymous jury. We actually affirmed the decision here and said the anonymous jury was actually appropriate in this case. Uh, and in a dissent, we actually said that this case was inappropriately handled, that this juvenile should have been sentenced as an adult based on what was happening in all other similarly situated cases. It's fascinating, right? So we decided against the black uh, defendant here and against the white defendant here, just to be clear. It was really, for me, one of the first times that I thought about the distinction between discrimination in its classic form and white privilege, like as this whole other thing. And are, like what, so just thinking about those two was fascinating, so we can talk a little bit more about that later. So anyway, clerk for Justice Page, came back to Detroit, worked, went, I, I went to law school on what I called the Thurgood Marshall Plan. I was gonna change the world through high impact class action litigation, litigate the next Brown v. Board, right? I was that kid in Robinson desegregating a school district, and by golly, we were gonna fix all that, whatever that was. Um, went to the firm that had the class action portfolio, sat in a windowless office like this room, but about one one hundredth the size, um, and wondered why I pulled, why I got a headache every day when I pulled in the parking structure, and I'm talking to a, a neural orthopedist or orthopedic surgeon, some some brain eye specialist at some point who's in my eye. <laughs> And he says to me, you know, what's, you know what's wrong with you? And I was like, no, what? You're going to tell me. Like, I have a tumor or something. He says, you need a new job. <laughs> I hated being an attorney, as it turned out. Uh, I was a litigator, uh, and I was OK at it, but I just hated it. It wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't the difference I wanted to make in the world. Um, and so I left the law firm. I co-founded this organization called Think Detroit with this amazing guy I'd gone to high school and law school with named Mike Tenbush. Uh, we ultimately merged it with the Detroit Police Athletic League, and quick story about that, I had volunteered for Pell a couple of years before as a young attorney, um, really disappointed with the quality of the programs, had volunteered to fix it, had never gotten phone calls back, finally said, I'm going to start my own organization, screw you guys. We started Think Detroit, um, and that was a journey, more on that in a moment, and then years later, merged with Pell, right, effectively taking them over. Um, kind of full circle. So uh, I won't even tell you the story of, of kind of founding Think Detroit, um, except to say that it was a labor of love. Uh, no money, um, just no anything, no office. No, we, we found a basement uh, in, the, in, the, in a church and kind of started the organization there, served 120 kids through youth development, uh, youth sports and leadership development. Baseball the first summer, 119 of the 120 had never played baseball before. Uh, we literally went O for the season, and it was the most miraculous summer of my life. It was incredible. Uh, and I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, right? That was the kind of difference that I wanted to make. Um, and so I left the practice of law, went and worked at Think Detroit full time. Um, after a while, I uh, wanted to figure out how the money worked in this system, and so I went to the Kellogg Foundation for about a year and a half. Kellogg, based in Battle Creek, Michigan, was close enough to Detroit to see the smoke, but too far away to fight the fire. Uh, and so I left after a year and a half, back to Detroit, and led Excellent Schools Detroit. Uh, Excellent Schools Detroit was this organization created by a coalition. And that coalition really wanted to fix public education in Detroit, charter and traditional schools. And you all have read all that stuff uh, you know, over the last few years. It's been uh, one heck of a journey. Um, long story short, over, after five years, that culminated in this huge legislative fight. Last year, uh, up in Lansing, I actually am registered as a lobbyist. Everybody at our organization is all in on getting uh, three things done through some legislation. We get the mayor recruited to do that work. And I should tell you this story. I'd been sending the, the mayor letters 
um, week after week, month after month, and meeting with folks on his team to get him involved in this. And what no mayor in their right mind wants to touch education in, in Detroit. Like, you're not responsible for it, and it's a third rail, and it's a hot mess. Like, why would you ever want to take responsibility for that, right? Any Detroiters in the room? Yeah, so you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so the mayor's avoiding me, and his staff is, like, shielding him. They're like, oh, we'll give this to the mayor, you know, and they don't. Um, and after a while, I figured that out, and I'm at a silent auction for a nonprofit, and uh, one of the auction items is lunch with the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> and $400 later, I won lunch with the mayor. Uh, and so I have lunch with the mayor, and I slide this letter across the table to him and have him read it at lunch. And um, that doesn't actually tip him over, but he starts all talking about uh, a colleague in the work in Detroit and how much he enjoys her and thinks she's a great leader. And so I left the lunch and called her and said, you've got to do, you know, reinforce this letter, so on and so forth. And one thing they do, another, we got him. Long story short, we get up to Lansing. We went on two of the three big issues. I don't love the mayor is working our third issue. I wanted to do it a slightly different way, but it is what it is. And we lost on the third issue, right? Um, and I'll, I won't, bore, won't suffer you the story. Uh, except to say um, that there were very powerful interests um, led by a family member of the person for whom this building is named. Um, and, uh, and we lost. Um, and that's what happens in politics uh, and sports, right? Sometimes you lose. Um, and then you got to try again at some point down the road. Um, so that's where we found ourselves. Uh, and after that, the other lesson I learned at Excellent Schools Detroit really quickly is that it's a relay, not a, not a sprint and not a marathon. So you don't run the whole leg of the race yourself. You know that quote from Dr. King about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice? Like that, somebody said to me, that arc is so long that it's, it's, a re, it's, a, it's not a marathon, it is a relay. You can't run it all yourself. Your job is to run your leg really well and pass the baton to the next folks who will lead that charge. And so I passed the baton at Excellent Schools Detroit and was privileged to land at Goodwill. So really quickly, so that's the story. Like that's, and that brings me here today. I've been at Goodwill for 11 months. Let me tell you really quickly about Goodwill because most folks don't know a thing about Goodwill and I can't stand in front of a room full of folks and not tell you a little bit about this amazing organization. This is just kind of how most Goodwills work. This is our description of it in Detroit. By the way, Goodwills have physical boundaries so I am not pitching Goodwill Detroit. I'm actually gonna pitch you on Goodwill Grand Rapids in just a moment. Um, <laughs> folks with employment barriers show up uh, at our doors through various mechanisms. Those barriers you know, take all sorts of forms um, and they enter programs designed to help them with those barriers. We supplement with a little bit of grant money and we help folks find permanent employment and so enter the world of work. And that's not about the job, it's about what the job gives you, right? Financial security, independence, self-esteem, dignity, unlocking for you your ability to make contributions that you want to make to your church, your family, your kids, whatever it is, right? You don't, you don't make those contributions until you achieve financial security, independence, and self-esteem and dignity. Some folks need a little more help. So they continue along and we give them what's called transitional work experience opportunities. It's where they actually work for us. Goodwills, unlike most other organizations, run businesses. Um, in Detroit, we happen to run three. In Grand Rapids, I'm not even sure how many it is. Kathy Crosby somewhere in the room who leads Goodwill Grand Rapids. There she is. Um, uh, so I'm not sure how many businesses it is here in Grand Rapids, but folks get transitional work experience and then transition into permanent employment or sometimes transition into permanent employment with us, achieving those good outcomes. And if we run the business as well, we generate revenue, which goes right back into our work right, helping to fund it so we're not overly dependent upon philanthropy. So here's the pitch. Every goodwill is geographically bounded. You guys live, work, and play in the boundary that is supported by Goodwill Industries of Grand Rapids. This is the information for Goodwill Industries of Grand Rapids. That's the website and that's the phone number. Call, go to the website, go to the stores, make donations, do good. All right, that's it. Okay, so Based on that story, like what do I know about leadership? Here's my, here's my thought. So I wanna talk about the process of leadership first, my thoughts about the process of leadership. I wanna talk second about kind of passion and energy. Um, third, about how to sustain that. And then lastly, just a few other lessons. So four things. So first, the process. So really simple. There's a current state. There's this other thing that you think is possible, right? 
And the only way to get from the current state to this other thing that you think is possible is relationship with and interaction with others. And by the way, if there's like one takeaway from this whole thing, one theme that knits it all together, is that leadership only happens in the context of relationship. And like, we all know that, and we all forget it all the time, right? All the time. I would argue that our president has forgotten that, like right now, right? It only happens in relationship with and interaction with others. Now, what does that mean? Like, what, what's happening in that? So this is what leadership is, right? It's, and like, what's happening in here is really the question. So here's what I think is happening in there. Here's how it works for me in all those experiences that I just described. You're interacting with others and you encounter either resistance or enrollment. There's some idea that you're pitching. There's this thing, there's this uh, professor at Harvard who talks about leadership really as being about the distribution of loss. Like, leadership matters. When you're distributing wins, well, it's easy. Everybody gets a win, right? Let me pass those out. Anybody resistant to that? No. Like, everyone wins, right? It's when you're distributing wins and losses that people are like, wait a minute, I don't want that loss, right? That's when leadership really matters. And so you encounter resistance to that, or people are like, okay, yeah, I see the big picture you're talking about, I'll take a loss on this one in order to get to this bigger win, whatever that is. Resistance or enrollment. Why is this happening? So sometimes it's them, right? There's this whole other person who's got say in the matter, but sometimes it's you. And it's this understanding of who and how we are being that matters. That's the, now, like, why am I focusing on that? Because to the extent that you're getting resistance or enrollment based on them, there's nothing you can do about it. If that's their baggage, there's nothing you can do about their baggage. If that's their, like, yeah, I want to do that, like, then, and you don't have anything, like, that's, there's nothing you can do about that. What you have control over as a leader is who you are being and how you are being it in the context of this relationship, right? Am I listening? Am I being supportive? Am I being understanding? Am I getting the loss that I'm actually asking them to take? Right? Like all of that, and how am I being that? Like how am I being, like who am I being in this context with you? Am I being related to you? Or am I not paying enough attention to you because I'm keeping my eye on this big prize? Right? Like who you're being and how you're being it matters. For me anyway, that's what I found. And I go back to here and I try and check myself. I change who or how I'm being, get back into a relationship with folks, and try again. And it just goes over and over and over again. And that's what leadership is, for me, in a nutshell. Like, that's the process that I'm following. And that's the process I would argue that most people are following, whether they realize it or not, in the context of trying to lead, trying to be a leader. OK. What's that mean? So this is Gandhi's quote. Gandhi, great leader and flawed human being, right? So this isn't about Gandhi at the moment. It's about the quote. As human beings, our greatness lies not so much in being able to remake the world, that is the myth of the atomic age, as in being able to remake ourselves. I mean, think about what he did, right? He had no control over what the British Empire was doing. He had control over who he was and how he was being in relationship to the British Empire. And over and over and over again, over decades, right, he adapted himself, got back into relationship with them or with other folks in India, and tried again and again and again, whether it was the march to the sea over and over again, right, whatever it was that he was doing. It was that process over and over and over again. And what he's saying is that you can remake the world, but your greatness doesn't lie there. Your greatness lies in being able to remake yourself. Right. That, I love that quote. All right, so that's the process. Second, passion. Like, what does it mean to find your passion? So as a leader, people talk about, you got you to find your passion, right? You got to know what you're what you're going after. Um, so two thoughts here. One is, um, there, there are kind of two schools of thought here. Um, 
and I don't mean to be dismissive of the first, but I'm gonna be a little dismissive of the first, uh, which cuts against things I'm gonna tell you later. So this is me not being my best version of myself, right? I need to adapt and like, right, remake who I'm being in this context. But um, so one version is go find yourself, right? Like go find, and I don't, I don't even know what that means, go find yourself. And don't get me wrong, I'm into yoga, I go to retreats, I read, I'm like, I'm as tree huggy as anybody you've ever met, right? Maybe not anybody, but most people. And still, I don't know anybody who's found their passion that way. Like, it's a great way to relax, it's a great way to recharge, it's a great way to like reconnect with energy, like your energy sources, but I don't think you figure out the difference you want to make in the world through that mechanism. I think the way you figure out the difference you want to make in the world, and so young people, like 20-somethings who are figuring it out, I don't think you find it, I think you create it. I think you create it. That means go try stuff, right? Try and fail, try and succeed, try and half succeed or half fail, whatever. The point is in trying things, you'll find what you love. Like, and in finding what you love, like that, so it was only in, if I had tried to find this Think Detroit thing that Mike Tembush and I co-founded, like I never would have found it. It was in getting frustrated with Pal and in creating this other organization that was designed to serve 120 kids that I was like, oh my God, that's the difference I want to make in the world, right? You just create it. And there's nothing, there's nothing crazy about it, so second thing, you, like we're not looking for heroes, you're not starting off trying to be a Gandhi or a Dr. King or any, like you're not trying to do anything world changing, you're just trying to change this thing, this one thing right in front of you. And it's amazing where that can take you sometimes, right? Maybe from starting this nonprofit organization to standing in Lowenstein Hall, Lowenstein? Loosemore, Loosemore Hall at the Howenstein Center talking to a room full of folks about like your journey and leadership and so on. So. I just really believe in, in, in finding this thing, finding this thing that you want to make a difference around, it's not, like you're not going to find it in books. You're going to find it in action. Like get in action, just go try. Go mentor, go coach, go, what, go teach, go whatever, just go try. And in the process of trying, like in the process of living, you'll find that difference that you want to make in the world. So that's a little bit about my experience around creating passion. Um, and finding my passion. Start small, 120 kids, it now serves 13,000. Like, never saw that coming. That first year, it was 120 kids. We just want to serve 120 kids, right? Later on, we're serving 13,000, and then, then like big pictures start to emerge later. Just start small and try. Second thing, or do, don't try, do, right? All right, sustaining yourself. Third thing, um, so two lessons that I want to share with you here. One is around committing to your two personal values. So finding and committing to personal values. There's this, there's this literature about, thank you, there's this literature about um, uh, employee engagement and like where, like, like what employees are engaged and what employees aren't and why and what difference like does it make in the world and how can you help those employees get engaged if you're running an organization or what have you. And here's the really fascinating thing about this. This is really interesting. So it's not, it's not clarity, so there's this matrix, right? So like clarity about organizational values, clarity about uh, your personal values. Um, and like, it's not clarity about organizational values that has you engaged at work. It's clarity about your own. You're much happier, you're much more engaged, you're much more productive if it's not about finding an organization that's the perfect fit, like it's not their values that matter, it's yours. Do you even know what they are, right? So I will tell you, I'm 48 now. Um, and I didn't figure this out right away, but I now have seven core values that guide me uh, daily in the work that I do. I am curious, I'm open-minded, I'm grateful, and I'm loving. I'm in action, I am a contribution, and I have integrity, I have probity. That seventh means like I act in ways that are consistent with the other six all the time. Those are on my mirror, in the bathroom. I try and live one every day. I reflect at the end of each day when I'm br so brushing my teeth, two minutes in the morning, which value is it to this value? Two minutes at the end of the day brushing my teeth, how'd I do on that value, right? Like just that four minutes of reflection every day, incredible leadership lessons while brushing my teeth. <laughs> 
All right, second thing around sustaining yourself, uh, energy. And here specifically, so this, uh, sorry, cheesy graphic. Uh, pay no attention to the graphic <laughs> on my chest. Um, the, the lesson here is around the power of pairs. Um, it's been a fascinating journey for me. Uh, probably the time in my professional career where I had the most energy as a leader was in leading Think Detroit, that nonprofit that we founded, the 120 kids, and grew it to 13,000. And why is that? It's because I was paired with a guy, Mike Tenbush, who I'd gone to high school and law school with, who was a dear friend, so on and so forth. And when he was tired, I was high. And when I was tired, he was high. And like we were able to balance each other out in amazing ways. And the power of paired leadership in that context, um, in other contexts, I think is incredible. And for me anyway, it has been probably the most profound thing I have learned about myself and energy in the context of leadership. When I'm leading alone or feel like I'm leading alone, I get tired. We all do, right? It's when you have a partner in leadership and I would argue that when you have a team, like that gets tiring too because you're trying to manage team dynamics. One person, like there's this amazing thing that happens when you're paired with the right person that just is incredible, just incredible. Um, and so I always encourage folks, if you're starting an organization, like find a partner. Um, whatever that is, just find a partner who you click with and go make that happen and you will find that it sustains your energy much more effectively than if it doesn't. Um, quick story about Mike Tembush and I, we, uh, oh, this is an awful story about Detroit, so this is not Detroit, I want you to know. What you read in the papers is true, and it's this much of this big a story about Detroit, like we've had this horrible rap for a lot of years. It's my town, love that city, love the people, like it's an amazing place, and if you haven't been, time to come. Come see us, all right? Um, and we were starting this, pro this program and this organization in one of the worst areas of the city, then called the Cass Corridor, now affectionately known as Midtown. Um, and uh, we were walking the Cass Corridor uh, to one of the handful of businesses in the Cass Corridor, which was the red light district at the time, looking for businesses to sponsor the program. And uh, <laughs> on more than one occasion, we were propositioned by prostitutes in the Cass Corridor, walking the street, trying to find businesses to support this league. Like, that's the kind of environment that we were in, you know, like it was, it was, it was rough, it was awful. And would never have happened, never have happened had we not found the power of paired leadership. Um, all right, one last thing, and then we can just talk a little bit. Uh, other lessons on the journey. Um, so three, one is be smart with your strengths. So I'm a big fan of personality types. Do you guys know your personality? Like your Myers-Briggs personality, Netflix and all that? Yeah, and some, like, some people are like, oh, that's meaningful. Some people are like, ah, that's just all you know, bogus. Whatever, it works for me, right? Most important, does it work for you? Great, if it doesn't, then find something else that works for you. It works for me. In that context, like I know my strengths. I'm an INTJ, right? So rational, like logical, whatever, and sometimes a jerk, because INTJs can kind of sometimes be jerks. And so if you are like too reliant on, like, so you gotta know that you're a jerk. Like, and that's a strength at times, but it, like played too hard, it's an you know, awful weakness. Chases everybody out of the room, all right? You gotta figure out how to be smart with your strengths. It's not your weaknesses that'll kill you. It's like your strengths overplayed that kill you as a leader. Um, so recognize your strengths as potential weaknesses, um, the same way that, at least uh, that's been my experience. Second. Be humble. So a quick pie chart. This little yellow slice is what you know that you know in the world, right? Anybody know what this is? What you know you don't know, right, exactly. And then what's all this? What you don't know you don't know, right? Most of the world is stuff that you don't know. Most of the world is stuff I don't know. And I don't even know, I don't know it, <laughs> right? Like, whoa, <laughs> what is that? What did this guy just say? Right, so I know, I know, I don't know, public speaking. I can speak to an audience, right? I got that, I know that. I know I don't know rocket science. I couldn't put an astronaut on the moon to save my life, right? I know I don't know how to do that. There's a whole world of stuff I don't know, and I don't even know enough to know that I don't know it. And that's the stuff that kills you too, right? So one is overplaying your strength, the second is this other stuff. So like, 
I knew some politics. I didn't know other politics. And then there was a whole world of politics I knew nothing about and didn't even know I didn't know anything about it, right? And that's one of the reasons we lost. Like, I didn't know that whole world of politics. So you got to be humble. you got to know that there's all this stuff out there. And if you know it, then you start to ask about it. All right? And you can start to shrink that pie a little bit. Or you can start to recruit allies who do know this stuff, or whatever it is. And in the world of leadership, this is the stuff that gets you in trouble when you're pushing for something really hard. Third thing um, is be unreasonable. So last thought here. Uh, we've all got reasons that we don't do things. Like there are hard things to do. Um, oh, so I'll give an example. Um, was asked to come here and speak uh, to a room full of folks today. Uh, and um, it wasn't a particularly convenient day to do it, right? And so there was like a reason not to do it. There was a reason to say no, right? And it's only in being unreasonable with oneself that you end up across the state talking to a room full of folks about your leadership lessons and sharing your story about Goodwill or about Excellent Schools Detroit or whatever it is. Like you have to be unreasonable with yourself. You got to talk yourself out of the reasons that you have for not doing whatever it is. And every one of you right now is sitting on some idea that you've had forever, like something you wanted to do, but there are reasons that you haven't done it. And I'm here to tell you, like, whatever. Get over your reasons. Like, let them go and be unreasonable with yourself and try, because it's only in trying the stuff that you find your passion, right? And then you get busy changing the world or changing your family or whatever it is, changing your part of the world and making the kind of difference in the world that you want to make. Um, that has been my story and my journey uh, for these 48 years. Uh, last thing I will tell you is that I'm still learning every day. Um, I reflected long and hard about like, what I learned out of the ESD thing and the loss up at the state legislature. And, you know, what, what about the traditional district and charter environment in Detroit works and what doesn't work? And you know, what are my takeaways from trying to lead that coalition? And what did I do well and what did I do poorly? And like, I, you know, still figuring that out still figuring that out uh, at 48, and I'm sure I'll still be figuring it out at 78 and 88, God willing. Um, and that's just the nature of life, and the nature of this journey that we're on. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure to be with you, and that concludes my remarks, but happy to take questions or comments or thoughts, like just have a conversation with you um, going forward. Thanks. So I think, these, I think these mics are up here because you can come up to the mic and ask a question or make a comment or what have you. Maybe about anything. Like, I'm happy to talk about anything. Or nothing. Hi, my name's Cameron Jones. I'm a Cook Leadership Fellow here. First, want to say thank you so much for coming out to speak. It's been a real privilege for myself, I'm sure, for everyone else in the audience. Uh, my question for you is, I'd appreciate if you could talk a little bit about ethical leadership and if you could maybe give an example of a time when you hit an ethical dilemma and you made that decision on what you did, your thoughts that you went through as you were making that decision and, and how you came to that final decision, how you approached that conflict and, and reconciled it with yourself. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Great, interesting question, provocative question. Um, I don't know if I'm going to come up with a great example off the top of my head. I, uh, the one that comes to mind, so ethical leadership is an interesting kind of question around ethics and leadership. Um, I can think of ethical dilemmas that weren't necessarily leadership dilemmas. I mean, they weren't, they were in the context of relationship with others, certainly, but not around like a difference between current state and something else that was possible. Um, Sorry, I'm pausing just to think if I can come up with one, a good one. I am not. Uh, I will, I'll just tell you about this one ethical dilemma that popped up for me. So when I was at the Kellogg Foundation, um, a gentleman called me. I mean, your job is to give away money when you're at a foundation, right? And you get phone calls all the time and grant applications and the like. And this guy calls me. Um, old, um, a very elderly gentleman who had been, uh, I think had co-founded an organization, uh, the organization about which he was calling. 
And he wasn't running it anymore. I think he was on the board. He was some kind of, in some kind of leadership capacity, but not in the day-to-day -day capacity of the organization. And he says to me, hey, um, if you make a grant, and I don't remember the name of the organization, I don't remember the man's name, thankfully, so I don't have to have an ethical dilemma around sharing it right now. <laughs> uh, and he says to me, hey, if you give this organization a grant for $100,000, I will cut you a check for $25,000 of that amount and turn it right back around and give it to you. Um, yeah, like, ugh, ugh, like really, I mean, good organization, doing good work, and like, oh man, like really, did you just call me and say that? Ugh, like, <laughs> do I have to, should I be reporting? Like, what should I, I don't need, so what do you do in that situation? Um, uh, and I don't have great answers. I took this amazing ethics course in law school, um, and I couldn't tell you a thing about it at this point in time. Um, like, I'm not, an, I'm, not a, I'm not a student of ethics, I would say. What I am, though, is guided by those seven values that I shared with you earlier. Uh, um, and kind of in the context of those values, uh, and I went and talked with one, I went and talked with my supervisor about it in, a, in an abstract sense, right? So, hey, what if you got a call from a, <laughs> right? Not saying it happened and I'm asking for a friend. Um, <laughs> uh, and got some advice um, and then decided on my own that what I would do was tell the gentleman, um, thank you but no, uh, and uh, I'm not going to report it. Uh, and I'm incredibly disappointed, and I hope you're not engaging this behavior with other, other foundations and the like, because um, you're actually doing your organization and the young people you're serving through your organization a disservice. Um, and that was where I left it. It is, I will t you are bound to, I mean, and that's just one of many examples, uh, but you're bound to encounter these. Um, maybe, you know what's fascinating? So I'm like rambling about this now. In the context of political leadership, like this shows up all the time, right? Uh, like folks, like, you know, bribery, kickback, so on and so forth, like in the context of politics. Um, and not even straight bribery or kickbacks, but like, you know, like I should do this because it's gonna help, you know, it's gonna keep this really powerful constituent of mine very happy, and I'm gonna need to keep them happy in the, if, to get reelected. Um, Yeah, I don't know what to tell you about that, other than it just, I mean, it's incredibly sad for me. Uh, because what has happened there is that the thing that's possible, oh, so you know what? So here's this other thing that I thought about sharing and I didn't, um, but maybe I should. So this whole, like, what is possible thing. So another way of thinking about that is, like, what, like, are you going to stand for that? Like, so there's this, somebody once said to me, there's a real difference between com being committed to something and being interested in something. And when you're interested in something, you're like, oh yeah, like I want to see that happen. But like when push comes to shove, you're not doing, excuse my French, but you're not doing shit to actually make it happen, <laughs> right? Like so that's being interested in something. Being committed to something means that you're willing to be unreasonable with yourself to make it happen, right? And to keep after it over and over and over again. And I guess in the context of people who like do bad things, unethical things, um, they're, not, they're certainly not standing for the possibility of something beautiful. Like what they're standing for is the possibility of enriching themselves or typically something very selfish. Um, and that's sad in the context of leadership. It, it's still leadership, right? You're leading people toward this outcome <laughs> that you're committed to, which is around yourself. Um, and that just isn't, let me say it this way, there's nothing noble or honorable about that form of leadership, in my opinion. Other thoughts, questions? Hi, Alex Long, um, CLA alumni and a GVCU employee. Um, today, they replayed an interview with Jay Gross and Nicole Hannah Jones from New York Times Magazine. She was discussing how she checked her privilege and then enrolled her daughter in Bed-Stuy, like 307 in New York. I was wondering if you could talk about Detroit public schools and whether or not you put your kids in them or whether or not you exercise your ability to then get them out of Detroit public schools and go to. Yeah. Private school, like you did, or brother rights, or private yeah. schools, or so on. Yeah, great question. Uh, my, I will tell you, and this is a this is a dilemma that every parent will face. Well, not every parent. Sometimes you you're not in this situation at all. But um, 
uh, being committed to the city, moved back to the city and was uh, married um, at the time to a woman who was not from Detroit and never loved Detroit. Uh, she was a military brat and from the DC area uh, kind of most recently. I mean, so I didn't want to be in the city. So I was like standing for the possibility, like being committed to the possibility that we were going to be part of this long awaited renaissance for the city of Detroit. And uh, we're living in the city in Northwest Detroit and uh, we've started our family and our kids are you know, not quite school age yet. Um, and I am driving home. I've gone and picked the kids up. I was their primary caregiver at the time. So my uh, then wife was working at the University of Michigan. So she was commuting up to Ann Arbor every day and back. And so I had gone and picked the kids up from school and I'm driving them home and I drive by a group of kids behaving really badly, uh, much older kids, like high school kids, behaving really badly. And I'm normally the guy who would stop the car and like get out and be like, no, da, 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 right, and like try and like make that work much better. Um, and I didn't, I like looked in the rear view mirror and saw my kids who were like probably both still in car seats, facing forward at this point, so a little bigger, but. Uh, and I had this moment where I was like, oh, huh. Like I, no, like that's just not, that's, no, there's like a role I want to play for them, and it, this is not, that wouldn't be consistent with it. As much as I want to be that guy who hops out of the car and does that in that situation, that's not me. And everybody's got to make that call for themselves. Um, and in that moment, what I knew was that I was going to relent to my wife's request that we move out of Detroit. And so we did. We moved to Ypsilanti. Uh, and we then divorced, and then I moved back, <laughs> um, uh, probably in part because of that. Um, uh, and my kids have gone to a mix of private and public schools in Ypsilanti. Um, I am immensely uh, I don't even know what the right word is. I have immense respect for folks who choose differently, and I know folks in my, in my personal life who have said, nope, I am committed, to, I am so committed to the idea of public education in Detroit that I'm sending my kids there. And I'm just gonna supplement or do whatever I need to do, whether it's a charter school or a DPS school, even though I have other options. Um, and uh, I just wasn't willing to do it for my kids, uh, is the honest truth. That's not, like, I'm, I was committed to changing the institutions. Um, and this is ultimately why I left Think Detroit. I realized that the difference for me that I wanted to make was to change the institution, um, not to kind of pluck individual kids out of the river. Um, and I felt like sending my kids wasn't going to change the institution. It was just going to help some kids in the, in the classroom they were going to be in, and so I didn't do it. That having been said, like, do, does I, I still lay awake at night and wonder about that, right? Was that the right call to make? I mean, I just don't know. I just don't know. Other thoughts, yeah? This thing is pretty tall. Dan, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm very impressed with your observations and a man at such a young age. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Because <laughs> leadership... It's nice to be called young, too. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you would appreciate that. Indeed. Uh, from my perspective, everybody's younger. Uh, leadership, if you're around long enough, you realize is a very complex issue. And lots of people like to talk about it as if it's something you learn. And I'm a fellow Detroiter, uh, not the suburbs, but Detroit, grew up there. And a uh, fellow U of M grad, only engineering degrees and MBA. Go and blue. spent 30 plus years uh, in a high tech industry. Retired and now I serve on a lot of nonprofit boards. And I've been in West Michigan for a number of years. And I've been, most of the nonprofits are involved with education. Mm -hmm. College, public schools, all that sort of stuff. Things mm -hmm. like junior achievement, first robotics. Uh, familiar with Focus Hope in Detroit, yeah. and a number of institutions. So I'm really impressed with what you've stepped out to do along the way. But one of the questions I really am interested in learning about is I read about Detroit because I'm quite removed from it, so I have to rely on the papers quite often. And they're not altogether very informative sometimes is what are the real challenges you saw in trying to uh, change uh, the system of the Detroit public schools? Mm. Uh, I know it's not a simple question, but I'm just, you were right in the middle of it, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to learn what your perspectives are on that. Yeah, um, and this, I think I didn't answer the second half of your question, which was similar, kind of thoughts about the state of public education in Detroit. Um, 
Gosh, I'll try and tackle this maybe in two different uh, ways. One is uh, like what were the challenges as I saw them? Um, and then maybe like given where we are today, which is in a very, it's a very different place than we were uh, even two years ago. Like what are the challenges today? Um, uh, and let me say one other thing. Uh, it's a great comment. Um, Folks do talk about leadership like it's something you learn. And uh, you can, but I would argue like only if you're actually trying to like learn about leadership, like learn leadership. And that means reflect on your practice of leadership. And most folks like lead and call themselves reflecting on it and they're not really. Like they're not, you're just like, you're busy and you're acting, right? And you're standing for something that's great and you're not actually getting better because you're not doing, you know that, that wheel? Like you're not actually thinking about who you're being and how you're being and then adapting yourself. Like you're not doing that work. And you just keep showing up over and over again as the same person. And that's not like getting, that's not becoming a better leader. So I agree, people talk about it that way. I'm comfortable talking about it that way because I believe that you can actually think about the wheel like and, and adapt yourself over time and get better and better and better. But only if you're working at it. I didn't even say, so, so, so schools. Um, you know, I entered that, I, I would argue that I entered that work um, from a pretty naive place in hindsight. Um, uh, and in a million ways, right? I mean, education is, incre so a friend of mine says that there are three kinds of systems in the world. There's simple, complicated, and complex systems. Simple systems, you just need a set of protocols. And you follow those protocols and you can do it, you know, produce the same result, whether you have expertise or not. So I love to bake. Um, I don't know how many folks in here love to bake, but I, like I love making any sweet bread. I'm on it. Like, let's do that, right? <laughs> Mostly because I love to eat sweet breads. But um, uh, we can all follow the same recipe and pretty much produce the same result, whether we are experts at baking or not, right? Simple system. Complicated system requires expertise and protocols. So we can put an astronaut on the moon over and over again, but only if we follow the processes, the protocols that have been laid out, and you better be a, like, you know, rocket, what do you call it, rocket scientists, right? To do that stuff, right? Um, so you need expertise and protocols. Then there are complex systems. Protocols, expertise, and you still can't guarantee the same result over and over again, right? And that's education. I don't care how good the teachers are. I don't care like how much you follow the same process that you followed the year before. Like the kids are different, the days are different. Like the dog ate the homework this day, they didn't. The like too many variables in the system. You can't produce the same outcome over and over and over again. It is a complex system, and I didn't get that. Like I wasn't thinking about it from that way, right? Um, and so like I am way more humble about and. Uh, not pessimistic ultimately, but perhaps more realistic about our ability to change, improve, change and improve public education, the rate at which that'll happen. Um, from a systems lens, there's a fundamental driver of public education challenges in Detroit, and that is the number of schools versus the number of kids, all that having been said. Um, you've got way too many schools for the number of kids. It's driven by lots of things from our unregulated kind of charter school opening market to our uh, like ridiculously poor ability to figure out how to close schools well and transition families well. And I mean, if you think about it, like nobody, nobody knows how to do that. Like that's amazing. How have we not figured out how to do that well? Transparently, you know, long run up to it so that like, I mean, how, you could do that well. We close other things and we do it pretty well. Like, but we don't close schools well at all. So we've got, something like 25,000 more seats than kids in the city of Detroit. And because in the city, in the state, money follows kids, every school is under-enrolled, meaning all those schools are underfunded. They're all a teacher or two or three short. And it's really hard to get to good results when you're short that kind of staff. It just, and that is, that's impacting 80% of schools across the city, charter and traditional. So that is, to me, a system driver. There are a few others. Um, obviously, a high number of kids growing up in low-income homes makes it more difficult. Um, those kids need more than other kids. That's just the truth. Uh, and until, as a state, we're willing to acknowledge that and actually do something about it, like we will get the results that you would expect us to get. Um, 
So I think we've got these two fundamental drivers at play in Detroit and statewide, and those are producing the results that you would expect them to produce. All that having been said, um, maybe two other quick thoughts. I'll offer one provocative thought and one not so provocative. So first, the provocative one. In most states, and most states do charters differently than we do, and most states actually are producing better educational outcomes than we are, and it's, it's just like, uh, I'm just, mm. Mm, who am I being, right? <laughs> um, so provocative thought number one, and that is that uh, in the city of Detroit right now, in most cities like Detroit, in most states like Michigan, invest, like reformers are interested in investing in the charter sector in order to put pressure on the traditional district to improve its practices and so on and so forth. And whether that's a good strategy or not, like I'm not here to debate at the moment, that's just what is happening in most states. In Detroit, in contrast, at this moment, there's this interesting notion that actually the charter sector is pretty stuck in its ways. Like it's actually been awfully protected by, I'm just gonna name it, the DeVos machinery, right? And like isn't actually interested in getting much better. Like it's protecting its turf. And you have this new DPS community district that was formed out of this legislation. You've got a new board and kind of just, it's all new and maybe there's an opportunity to invest in it in a way that actually puts pressure on the charter sector to get better. I don't know. Like, I will tell you there are things working against that, right? So when I was at Sachs Wallman, I mean, I'm a lefty and I was doing union side labor work. And I know I'm over time, but I'm just, like, I'm, now I'm on it. So uh, just get up and go to the restroom if you gotta go. Uh, um, and I saw, like, believe in the right to organize, believe in, like, a lot of things that organized labor produces for people, for working families and the like, and saw the worst of it as well, right? Saw teachers who I would never want to put my kid in front of, who I actually had to go get their job back uh, for them, you know, at an arbitration or a mediation area. So, like, I see both sides of that, that equation. And I have, like, I lose friends on the left and right all the time, like, flopping back and, like, pointing out both sides of that, right? Um, so there are reasons not to invest in DPSCD. Like, is labor interested in reforming that thing? Hard to know right now. But maybe, potentially, maybe not. Like, will they be you know, an asset or a disadvantage when it comes to that effort? Hard to know. So I think they're like, I think it's, once again, I mean, it's, I hate to punt on it, but complex as heck to figure out how do you invest in that system? Where are the leverage points in that system to actually make it better and different? Second other thought, not provocative at all, and that is that, um, well, it's provocative in its own way. Uh, one of the things that we know is that um, integrated schools are one of the best things for students ever, right? I mean, the data is pretty clear on this at this point. Um, and it's, like, it's just a matter of will. Like, you know, are we willing to sit next to each other in a classroom? We don't have our kids sitting next to each other in a classroom. Like, that's, that's what it boils down to. Uh, and all too often, regrettably, the answer is no. Uh, and Detroit is a victim of that, right? It is one of the most segregated big cities in the country. I think Milwaukee and Detroit are, you know, alternate one and two on the list. That is a um, pattern that is a result of decades of bad policy, right? Federal housing policy that actually redlined insurance uh, home ownership in Detroit and who could get insurance you know, for homes in certain places and black folk couldn't get insurance for homes in certain places and so they weren't allowed to live there, couldn't afford to live there. Um, like are we willing to reverse that, fix that, like actually integrate schools? You know, I ask it like it's a rhetorical question, it's not. Like, I mean the answer is either yes or no. Um, and you know, I don't know if we have the, the will to do it as a kind of, it's an amazing time. I guess I'll end with this. Um, it, is a, uh, it is at times a disheartening time to be a black man in this country. Um, and I may get a little emotional. I actually had to like stop engaging in multiracial conversations about racial equity for a while. I'm tired of leaving those conversations hurt all over again. I'm tired of white folk leaving those conversations hurt all over again. Like there's a different way. There's a much better, like it literally just boils down to, are you willing to, like who are you willing to have in your living room for crying out loud, you know? Like I hurt the same way you do. I love the same way you do, right? Like enough already, just enough. 
Thanks again for having me.